Hey, thank you for joining us today in part four of our series, The Path. If you've not been here for this series, never worry. The whole series is based around the premise that direction determines destination. Direction, not intentions, determines destination. And we said from the beginning, if you've been here, that oftentimes we think that if we just intend to be somewhere, we'll somehow get there. And so there's a disconnect between our intentions and the actual path that we choose. That's the principle of the path, which says that direction determines destination. Week two, we learned a verse. Not very many people remembered it last week or in the other service, so we'll see if anybody remembers any of the words. The prudent see danger and take Refuge, thank you for, for some of you. <laughs> and the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Some people say price, I'm okay with price. It's like we're, we're way open on the fill in the blank today. We've, we, we, we've all got to make a commitment, right, to responding appropriately to things on our path in life that are warning signals, like the prudent see danger and they do something about these warning signals and the simple just kind of keep going and, and they think it'll just work out and they pay the penalty. Last week we talked about that even if we were the wisest person in the world, that it's not enough to have information. And we saw this example from the life of Solomon who was considered the wisest man in the world, that towards the end of his life he abandoned God for a while, and so consequently all of his wisdom was to no avail. Because in every single decision and path we take, we need God because we don't have time or life to waste, and every path has a destination. Now today, I want to add one more part to the formula. Uh, like everything else uh, I've said so far, you may wonder why I bother to point this out, because it's so intuitive and obvious, but it's just something we don't think about, especially as it pertains, you know, to our financial path, or our spiritual path, or, um, you know, our morality path, or how we, you know, how we do certain things. For some reason, we just overlook this part. But like any other principle, it's important. It will impact your life whether you know it or not, whether you admit it or not. So here's the rest of the formula. Direction determines destination. But oftentimes, it's the things or people that get our attention that influence our direction. And so another way to say it, what gets our attention determines our direction and ultimately our destination. Or even shorter, attention determines direction. Attention determines direction. In fact, we even use that terminology in our language, like that grabbed my attention or she captured my attention. And so when something grabs or captures your attention, there is a sense in which we turn in that direction and now that influences the direction of our life. In fact, in the summer of 1989, I got a new senior pastor at my home church. My mom was going to be his family's realtor and as they relocated from Kentucky, my mom insisted, and I didn't really object, that I take the new pastor's daughter out to get to know the area. It's just a really friendly, hospitable thing to do. Because she was moving to Michigan for her senior year in high school, and so Jennifer Klingenfuss and I became friends, and then she captured my attention, okay? My life has never been the same. She got my attention, and there went the direction of my life. And now, like, there are people in this world that would not have been if she had not captured my attention. Now, I'm sure you can relate. We've all had those kind of defining moments when we're just going along in life, doing our own thing. It's like, whoa, like, what's that? What's that over there? Something can grab our attention, and it changes the entire direction of our lives. It can be a new way of doing life. It could be a person, it could be a job opportunity, I mean, it could be so many possible things. But when it happens, it's extremely powerful. Veering out of my lane in the direction of Jennifer is a positive example of this principle. But let's face it, like every principle, this one can work for us or against us. Because all of us have people or events or opportunities in our past that reflect the much more frequent flip side that looking back, there are people you wish you hadn't met or maybe relationships you wish you had never initiated or business opportunities you wish you had ignored. You know, life was better before those things grabbed your attention. In many cases, the path you were on before they came along was the path you should have stayed on, but you didn't. 
and what grabbed your attention maybe altered your direction. On every path that leads to disaster, the reason that we choose those paths is because there's something powerful and emotionally engaging on those paths. That's why we use that terminology. It grabbed my attention. And so often those things lead to our greatest regrets. Sometimes not, but sometimes they do. And, and why? Because it's a principle that attention influences direction, and every direction has a predetermined destination. There are things that have captured your attention and affection that you wish you had just glanced at and kept on going, right? But, but we've all done it at some point. It grabbed your attention, and you said, uh-oh, I shouldn't go there. Let me make sure I don't go there. Let's just, come on, focus, focus. Okay, it wouldn't hurt, like, just this one time, right? And soon enough, you start making decisions that alter your route. Now, there's another side to this before we get too far. There are things that grab our attention, but then there are also things we choose to pay attention to, to give attention to. And there's a big difference between those things that grab our attention and those things that we pay attention to. Grabbing our attention is all about emotion. It's all about the moment. Paying attention is all about intentionality. It's a decision we make. And we've all done this, all of us. There are things you wish you had paid more attention to. You may wish you had paid more attention to your health. You may wish you had paid more attention to, you know, your relationship with God. You may wish you had paid more attention to how you handled money when you were younger. You may wish you had, you know, paid more attention to a particular relationship that's now broken because apparently, you know, the two of you didn't focus enough on that relationship. Think how different your life would be if there had been things you had paid more attention to. Why is that? It's because of this principle. And here's why this is so powerful today. Right now, you've chosen to pay attention to those things. And right now, there are some things that are grabbing your attention. And on the flip side, there are some of us here where life just couldn't get better because you're finally paying attention to the things that are benefiting you the most. But here's an observation, and maybe your life is different. But the things that tend to grab my attention are generally dangerous. The things that I usually choose to pay attention to are generally the things that benefit me and set me up for success. But either way, whatever's grabbed your attention or you're paying attention to is right now, in this moment, whether it's financial, relationally, spiritually, professionally, academically, morally, it's impacting the direction of your life. And so... We know the principle, attention, direction, destination. In fact, throughout the scriptures, God reminds us of this very important principle. In fact, there are so many, I couldn't decide which ones to use because almost every author in the Bible alludes to this truth. But let me show you five of them because this is a big deal. The first one is found in Deuteronomy 7.12. And here's a bit of context. The people of Israel were about to go into the Holy Land and take it as their own. This is the promised land. But before they moved in and set up their new society, God gave the nation a system of laws to live by. And we, when he had finished outlining them and how they were to conduct themselves in their new home, he said, hey, here's our text. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, there's that path thing, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your forefathers. So there it is. Pay attention. Because God knew that once Israel settled into the new land, they would become enamored with the customs and the conduct of the surrounding nations. He knew that there were elements in those pagan cultures that had the potential to capture his people's attention. And so God instructed them, hey, to pay attention to the customs and conduct God set out. So God laid out a direction with a specific destination. In this case, national adherence to the law would result in a divine blessing, and later he would clarify the consequence of abandoning his law as well, that the path of disobedience would lead to divine 
disciplinary action, specifically invasion from the very nations they chose to emulate. Either way, the direction they chose would determine their destination, and what the nation chose to give their attention to would ultimately determine which path they chose. Now, years later, many years later, the second king of Israel, David, Reference this principle as well. Listen to his request of God in Psalm 119. Direct me in the, what? Path of your commands, for there I find delight. In other words, I want you to be a personal God who directs me in the path of your commands. Verse 37, he adds, turn my eyes, which throughout scripture is a metaphor for one's attention, turn my eyes away from worthless things. I mean, think about the power of that statement. God, please turn my eyes away from worthless things. Why? Because if I focus on worthless things, I'll be drawn in the direction of worthless things. And again, every single one of us, whether you're a Christian or not, can think of a time when our attention got fixed on something that turned out to be a waste of time. In David's words, it was a worthless, worthless thing. David knew that all too well in his own life. He used his eyes, at least on one occasion, that got him and his whole country in a lot of trouble. And so he asked, please, God, I want my eyes to be fixed on the things that matter. And then look at the last part of verse 37. Preserve my life according to your word. In other words, I don't want to end up at some stage of life and think, how in the world did I get here? Preserve my life by helping me to turn my gaze, my eyes, my attention away from worthless things and on your word. And that's a powerful verse, one I recommend memorizing. For not a day goes by that we are not tempted to allow our minds, our eyes, our attention to drift toward and run the risk of being captured by worthless things. Things that have potential to lure us down paths will regret taking. David's son Solomon, he also weighed in on this too. In Proverbs 4.25, he wrote, let your eyes look straight ahead, fix your gaze directly before you. In other words, don't allow yourselves to be distracted by things that have the potential to capture your attention, that have the power to draw your focus away from the things to which your attention should be fastened. Decide ahead of time to pay attention to those things that need and deserve your attention because the stuff you don't need to be looking at are never like straight in front of you. It's just a little bit over here, over there. A hundred, hundreds of years after the reign of King Solomon, Jesus showed up. He gave us his version of this principle in Matthew 6. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. In Bible times, since people didn't have electricity, they carried oil lamps when they walked at night. And if you've ever been camping and used a lantern, you know, you know the drill. You walk with the lantern either you know, in front of you or maybe even holding it on a stick in front of you because the farther the light is in front of you, the farther you can see. And there's a sense in which the light leads the way. And so Jesus is saying, your eye, like what you see, what you gaze at, what you pay attention to, is like the lantern of your entire life. It's a light that leads your way. As your body follows a light in the dark, so your life follows what your eyes focus on. And with that in mind, take another look at part of that verse. If your eyes are good... The Greek word translated good means wholesome, pure, healthy. Your whole body will be full of light. And that term light in the New Testament is used to denote something good or divine. What's Jesus' point? If your eyes are focused on good things, your body will be led in a good direction. As you expect, though, there might be a second half to this equation as well. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? As your eye goes, so goes your life. As your attention goes, so goes your life, for good or for bad. The things you give your attention to function as the directional beacon for your life. Attention establishes direction 
which determines destination. Now, I could give you more biblical references to support this simple equation, but I doubt uh, you need more convincing. Because if you're like me, the problem is not a lack of understanding as much as it is a lack of application. And again, it's like it's easy to see these principles at work in the lives of other people. In fact, you may be thinking like, oh man, I wish my, I wish my cousin or, or my daughter or, or my ex would hear this. Perhaps they should. But if they got the opportunity, would you come to mind to them as they came to mind to you? So for the time being, let's not worry about all the other people who might need to hear this and instead focus on those who are here, and that would be you. If it's true that we will steer our lives toward the people and things that capture our attention, then perhaps we should spend a few moments exploring the list of people and things that might be capturing our attention. Because up until this point, like, you haven't really thought about, probably, those distractions as being anything other than distractions. But they are, in fact, directing your life or to use Jesus' imagery, they are functioning as the light on your path. So you should at least know what or who they are. After all, there's a sense in which you have turned your future over to them. And you have, in a sense, turned the future of anyone you are responsible for over to them. And so what about you? You are aware of how easy it is to become distracted by things that we all have that have no business being a part of our lives. You know that from past experience. But what about now? What has your attention now? Who has your attention now? Has anything or anyone captured your attention that has no business being a part of your life right now? And be honest, right? Because there's no one to lie to right now except yourself. Because right now it's just you and you. I mean, you may feel like I'm part of the conversation, but I'm really not because it's just all in your head, right? And so there's nothing to be gained by being defensive. Like self-deception doesn't accomplish anything. In fact, the self-deception is also a path we choose. It doesn't lead to a hammock by the sea. Has anyone or anything captured your attention or affection in a way that's distracting you from the things or people that deserve your attention? Are you giving... um, Are you giving an inordinate amount of time or attention to something that a year ago wasn't even on the radar? Is is there anyone you're giving attention to that if if we're to become like public information, it might be a bit embarrassing or worse? Do your spouse or kids feel like they're competing for time that should be given to them anyway? Is there a distraction that began as a small thing that's become bigger with time? Is there like a hobby or pastime that began as a small expense, but now it's like a significant light item in your personal budget? Is there anything dividing your mind at work, at home, within the church family? Am I getting on your nerves yet? I am? Okay. Well, I'm I'm still going. Okay, we got more, more ground to cover. Let's ask the same question a different way. Is there something or someone you need to begin paying more attention to? Is there someone clamoring for your attention that deserves your attention, and instead of doing the right thing, you just make excuses? Or what are you putting off? What is it you just don't find the time to get around to because of other less important stuff? Your education, your kids, spiritual pursuits, you know, saving more, your health, Your parents, I mean, be honest, much is at stake because we don't drift in good directions. We discipline and prioritize ourselves there. What about your marriage? Is there something you need to give more attention to? I mean, culture argues that once you say, I do, it's time to hit autopilot as if good marriages fly by themselves, but they don't. What about the spiritual development of your kids, if you have kids or grandchildren? This is something you have to pay attention to. Few parents do in our culture. And the earlier, the better, right? Like I know too many many parents who treat their kids like automobiles. They wait for the red light on the dashboard to light up before giving them any attention. Preventative maintenance, we know, will help you avoid emergencies with your cars and your kids. But in both instances, it's something you have to pay attention to. 
So the point is, you don't have to be yanked around by your emotions and passions. You choose what you give your attention to. So what do you need to give more attention to right now? And if nothing's coming to mind, I mean, that's probably a good thing, but maybe we should run that same question through another filter. In the past six months, has anyone approached you, or more to the point, confronted you about a relationship or an issue in your life that you're focused on? Does your spouse keep bringing up the same stuff over and over? Have you heard something along the lines of, you know, I really think you're spending too much time with... I've noticed that you... Didn't you just... Haven't you already? Could it be that there are people in your life who are more concerned about the direction of your life than you are? Whatever or whoever has captured your attention, you have chosen to give, or what you've chosen to give your attention to, is at this moment influencing the direction of your life, for good or bad. But now that you're aware of how this all works, you have the opportunity to leverage it for your benefit. Now you're in a position to choose your destination rather than discovering it once you arrive. But choosing may require some change. Change doesn't come easy, especially when it requires us to redirect our attention away from people and things that have a strong emotional grip on us. Hebrews 2.1 sums it up this way. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. This New Testament author was addressing an audience whose attention had been diverted away from Christ. They had begun to drift they were careening toward things that had captured their attention. And like a good driver's ed teacher, the author urged his readers to get their eyes back on the road in front of them, lest they leave the road entirely. That was just his way of saying attention determines direction, and direction determines destination. I mean, there's a reason that the scriptures reiterate this principle over and over. God cares about your life and the direction you're headed. I mean, just think about that for a minute this morning. As in, like, God, the creator of the universe, cares about the direction and quality of your life. And so that's, that's one thing you and God have in common, right? Because if you and God care about your future, why resist him? It's become clear to you that there are things or people you need to pay less attention to, and things or people that maybe deserve more of your attention. Why not give in to that? Why resist what you know is true and right for you? Why not in this very moment enlist God's help, enlist the Holy Spirit in bringing about the change both you and your Heavenly Father desire? It's not easy, but maybe now is time to lay down any resistance you've had to God's will in your life and invite his help. And if you do, you'll discover that in shifting your attention to the things that please your Heavenly Father, you will actually be shifting your attention toward your Heavenly Father. Something wonderful happens when the resistance is gone, and in the end, that is what your Heavenly Father desires above all else. So if you don't remember anything else from this message, I hope you will remember this. As your attention goes, so goes your life. So pay careful attention to what you're paying attention to. Pay attention to the things that are competing for your attention. Pause before devoting your attention to anything and devote special attention to the things that deserve your attention. For as Jesus said, your eye is the lamp of the entire body, if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we struggle with this concept. We, we know it's true in our mind, but still so many things distract us, pursue us. So we ask for your help. We need your spirit to guide us and help us, to, to help us recognize when we're getting, when our attention is being grabbed or when we're paying attention to things that just are worthless. And then would you help us make the changes we need to make to pursue you better and to pursue the things that need our attention. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.